Um, I was going to say I had a lot of experience over the summer speaking Norwegian, although Norwegians don't give me much opportunity to speak uh, <laughs> because they very quickly changed to English. So it's uh, also a pleasure in Paris to be practicing you know, a little bit of my French. It is, uh, it is uh, wonderful to be back and I see the weather is also beautiful today. So I pray for tomorrow, it will also be nice. But tonight we are here to uh, talk about neuroscience, talk about the brain and the uh, typology. Uh, hopefully you have a handout. Um, may I use a, just a demonstration? Yes. Merci. Um, ah, this is uh, English. Yes, so there are uh, two versions, one en français and uh, one in English. And many of the things I will talk about tonight are summarized in the handouts. And Merci. We will also use these as part of an activity as well. And of course, afterward, if you have any questions, I'm hoping we actually have time for questions. Yes, I think we should. And uh, feel free, there's also plenty of drinks and so on in the back for us to enjoy. Um, given time, I will also do a demonstration live. And uh, this is a sort of simple device. It's not too fancy, but it's easy to carry around. When I take it into the airport, they think it is like headphones or something like that. But uh, they don't bother me. We already had also one person uh, have a chance to do a full brain scan today. Merci for dropping in. And uh, there will be more in the coming days. So I will still be here in Paris. So what is all of this uh, neuroscience about? What is the excitement? Uh, what does it have to say about type? And uh, is anyone here completely new to uh, the Jungian Myers-Briggs types? Anyone? No? Don't worry, I'm not. So it's uh, <laughs> not new. No. Uh, I've been doing this research uh, since 2006, the neuroscience research, and I was originally certified in type in 1994. So I, it has been some time uh, working with type. So I'm going to show you a little bit about my lab and uh, what kind of information we get from neuroscience. And then we will be connecting it to your lives and your skills and also to type. So here you can see some, uh, some nice little photos. And um, I'm not sure how well they show up. It is, it is okay. Yeah. Um, participants wear a cap. So it's a little bit like this, but it's more like a red Santa hat if you've ever worn one of those. And it has little electrodes in it and it reads voltage on the surface of the brain. For about one hour, everyone does a variety of tasks, all different kinds of tasks. So gaming, drawing, uh, some kind of communication. Uh, this woman here assisted me, she's a therapist and a coach, so in this case, she sent uh, six of her clients through a one-hour therapy session while we were reading the brain. And she's familiar with type. To give you a sense of the significance, she had a technique she'd been using for 20 years. And I could say the technique works pretty well, seen from the brain changes. But I said in some people, it works differently than you think. And why might that be? Well, as it turned out, there were uh, two participants with sensing preference and three with intuiting preference. And the two with sensing preference, their brains behave differently at the beginning. And so the whole process needed to maybe re rethink it a little bit because she has intuiting preference. And her style, her technique was built for other people with intuiting preference. And I said, it worked with the sensing preference, but by the way, there were some differences. So it's very good to know about type because type will then give you an idea without having to read the brain. Uh, of course, some math calculations, using some kind of visualization, imagination, a whole bunch of things, listening to music, answering emails, um, uh, giving a talk like I'm doing now, but for two minutes, you know, something quick. Uh, I've looked at many people even doing meditation and so on, Deepak Chopra, is a famous meditator. Yes, his brain really does change. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, but he did not go the deepest I have ever seen. I did have someone just a few days before him 
who was uh, more impressive in his meditation technique. But that young man is not known, and he's not a millionaire. Um, <laughs> so what do I do with all this data? What do I see? Well, this looks complicated, but let me tell you, it's not so complicated, because down here is just time. Okay, this is a measure of time this way. And then over here is a measure of volume. Like on a radio, the volume, is it quiet, is it loud? And we're asking overall in the whole brain, or the neocortex is what I look at, the outer layer of the brain that is unique, truly in its thickness and capacity compared to humans, uh, compared, you know, humans to other animals. Um, so here we see the times when it goes up and it goes down. It goes up a lot when the person is doing math problems. Here they did this activity where they sort their values. Um, that was uh, not so maybe engaging or maybe it was easier. Over here, word play. So this is an opportunity to have some fun, play some games with words. So uh, I might ask you to use uh, something in a sentence like um, microwave oven. Could you make a sentence for us? Uh, I put apple in, micro in a microwave oven. Parfait. Yes. Okay. And now are you ready for another word? Yes, yes. Philosophy oven. Philosophy what? Philosophy oven. Philosophy oven. <laughs> do, do we have a ENFP or ENTP? INFP? INTP? Ah, monsieur? Yes, a philosophy oven. I don't know exactly what you mean by oven. It, oh, it's not a real thing. <laughs> ah, yeah. You can make up whatever you want. So philosophy, what do you want to... Uh... Whatever you want. Whatever you want, it could be. So, um, anyone want to take a stab? Use it in a sentence? Yeah. Yes. Philosophy oven is great to transform your apple into ideas. Yes, wow. uh, that's right. Yeah, to transform an apple into ideas. Merci. It is. Um, so, there we see an example between something familiar and we make a literal sentence. We're still using imagination, though. You still thought of something imaginative. And then here we see an example where really extroverted intuiting, just surprise, you're given something, it's not even a real thing. And now use your imagination about something that's not real. Or is it real? If we have words for it, isn't that close enough? So these are the kinds of activities I give to people. So actually it's fun. Most people say the process is fun. One hour goes by very quickly. Uh, the other things, the 3D objects, Recalling a fax, using the phone, of course, this is the moment they use the phone. Uh, sometimes we can see. Relaxing, look how relaxing the physical activity is here with the ball toss. Just toss a tennis ball back and forth. Very nice. And uh, listening to some music, favorite music, it was actually quite engaging. So this is a very basic measure of the brain. Uh, I have noticed one thing about type that people with a uh, thinking preference, when they are given math problems or um, object rotation, there are other activities involving money, risk, uncertainty, that actually their brain gets more active. Whether it's easy or hard for them, it gets more active. People with feeling preference, when they do uh, the sorting of values, when they're shown pictures and they have to uh, understand the expressions on the people's faces, uh, when they hear an ethics situation and they want to know, um, you know, what would you do in this situation? The ethical thing, maybe convenient thing. So that's something I've noticed, just in a very basic measure. Now, another way we can look at the brain is from the view of a bird, bird's eye, looking downward. And I like to think of the brain as our toolbox. So what are some things that it helps us do? Uh, well, one up in the front, ah, this is the nose, the ears, yes. I want you to think for a moment. The human eyes can see so much, 120 degrees, this way, up and down. 
And all of us have a large thing in the middle of our visual field in front of our eyes. Some larger than others. Why don't we see our nose? Well, there is my nose. It is, but, you know, I really have to, to focus on it. Uh, the brain edits out the nose. The brain that doesn't see it. It fills in with what is supposed to be there. As you move your head, it knows what's going to be there, and it fills in. So the brain is a toolbox, but it's also somewhat devious, because it is our own, you know, the tool maker, the tool user, and the tools are the same thing. Yeah. So the, the regions up here in the front, very important. If the brain were like a company, then these would be the executives. Two CEOs. Imagine if every company had two CEOs. Many actually do, famous companies. Apple Computer had the Steve Jobs and the Steve Wozniak. Um, Microsoft had the Bill Gates and the Paul Allen. Uh, Google also, I don't remember their name, Sergey something and something something. <laughs> They're not quite as famous maybe. The brain also has two CEOs. This is the goal-focused CEO. This region gets active, it lights up when I ask a person to make a decision. So, uh, do you like ice cream? Yes, I do. Yes. Do you prefer chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? Oh, strawberry. Strawberry. Look how quick the answer that was. Not even one second. Yes, so you, you, it, it's really, you really like it, then you didn't have to think. No. Um, so that region, and I can say this part of your brain lit up and got active to make a decision. Now I'm going to ask you another question. But uh, I want you to just make up the answer. You'll understand. Why tonight are you wearing a pink blouse? I'm not wearing a pink blouse. But what would your answer be if you were? So, sorry, I didn't catch the answer. If you were wearing a pink blouse, yeah. what would it be? What the reason? Oh, the reason would be that uh, no, I, maybe I want to uh, to look like more fresh, more happy, ah. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to to look more fresh, more happy. This evening, I had a desire to do that. Isn't that great? You know, the brain can also come up with. Uh, we don't call them lies. We call them confabulation. Uh, probably the same word in French, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's very good at staying positive, giving explanations, focusing. What about this other CEO? Is open-ended. Ah, oh, this is interesting over here. Oh, I'm thirsty, let me have some. Um, oh, oh, wait, uh, there's something else over here I want to see. <gasps> ah, the time, oh yes, we must keep track of process. Ah, 7.04, okay. So this part of our brain is open-ended. Open-ended does not mean stupid, like a child. It pays attention to process, beginning, middle, end. But it is more free-flowing. It has no filter, no focus. It is more reflective. So more judgment, decision-making, over here, more open-ended, more focused on processing perceptions. Does this sound like anything you know already? Maybe? Yes, a type? Yes, so thinking and feeling are both judging functions. And sensing and intuiting are both perceiving functions. And in fact, I do find this quite consistently in the brain. It's really neat to see that uh, Jung came up with these ideas before there was any kind of EEG device or, you know, any kind of reasonable neuroscience. I mean, they had neuroscience, but they open your brain and they do something nasty. Um, so beautiful to see this connection to Jung. All these different things it helps us with. Excel at team sports. This doesn't mean this is the team sport part, but it helps you with all of the skills. If you're playing basketball or uh, football, Euro European football, so on, this part of the brain, right here, is very important. Um, many other things, seeing body language, hearing intention. 
which then gets us into something I think is important to understand about the brain. We're going to focus on one part, right here. This is this, the, uh, the right ear. What does this region help us with? Well, one, hearing melody and voice tone. So if you want me to talk like this, you know, I've got a slightly di different accent than I had before. Um, and uh, let's see if I can do a southern accent down in Arkansas. If you've ever had hush puppies and grits, I have no idea what those are going to be in French. <laughs> So there's a little bit of paying attention also to music and this region helps us, it's no surprise, to vary our tone, to sing. Uh, I won't try and sing for you, I'm not so bad, but I don't know what the result will be. Um, <laughs> you didn't pay to hear me sing. Uh, <laughs> recalling of melody. So just to hear in your mind. I can hear in my mind, no, different melodies. This region also gets active when we have to detect some person's intent. What is their intention implied by their voice tone? So if I came to you and I said, oh, I'm not angry at you. You're like, well, your voice uh, sounds a little bit angry. This region helps us recall emotionally charged experiences. So no wonder music, when we hear it, the music should move us emotionally. And people's voice tone, ideally, they're also speaking in a way that they're very excited and they're sad and we remember those. Finally, this region gets active when we have to manage a reaction inside of us, when we're feeling hostile. Hostile does not mean I'm going to, I, I want to punch you, but I'm not going to do that. I just bite my tongue and I don't say anything. It's what happens when we hear intention. So we see these different skills together in the same place. Voice tone, intention, music, emotional experiences, hostility. Oh, we have a melody right there. Yeah. Why is the brain organized this way? It is uh, the result of eons of evolutionary pressure, things that go together. So I'm walking on the street and I come and meet you. I can try and go by your facial expression and your clothing, but then you start talking. Maybe I don't know your language, but even if I don't know French, I can hear the intention, right? Hopefully. Or maybe the French specialize in sarcasm, like the English. So I don't even know what the, it's a bad intention, but usually this tells us. So we evolved to have these pressures to know. Uh, by the way, the other side, the left ear, is good at hearing words, the actual words spoken. Uh, and it also is good at managing reactions, but these will be sexual or pain reactions. You might think that's very strange, right? Why would hearing words and uh, sexual impulses be in the same place? Have you ever had a situation when you really want to hear and give someone's attention? Women, when do men listen more? When they're interested or not interested? <laughs> you know when they listen more. And then when they stop listening, what does that mean? <laughs> so there's a little bit of that. And then weirdly, managing pain is in the same area of the brain. So we can really go back and we could try and figure out what the story is. But that's not a type story. That's more like an evolutionary story. So we will leave that for some other day. And by the way, we will have time to stop and uh, do questions as I go before each new section. Now, what I would like you to do is um, get out your handout uh, in English or French, either one. It will look a little like this. Okay. And, um, well, we won't do this part quite yet. But first, what I'd like you to do is to look over the map. And uh, if you have a pen, great. If you don't, in your mind, I would like you to circle 10 <coughs> of the skills that likely describe you well.
What are your 10 best, your 10 favorite skills? S'il vous plaît. Okay, let's come together. Don't worry, it is not a resume. <laughs> not tonight. Um, now, if you could please share with uh, your neighbor, explore which uh, brain regions best meet your uh, personality type needs that might involve sharing your type preference, if you know that. Um, let the people just spend two or three minutes sharing. Hi, sama otamate kudasaimase. Nihongo deki nai no. Yeah, I always find that works with Japanese audience or not Japanese audience. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so let's. Uh, I know this was very quick, but um, let's hear a few, uh, some feedback from the audience. Were there any two people who had the same type preference? Ah, voila. Could you tell us about the similarity and difference, English or French? Well, we're both, ENF we're both ENFPs. And so basically, um, we would really focus on exploring, staying open, and focusing on the concepts, as well as really sorting out emotions and personal value. Mm. Do you want to add something? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, it was really around that. It was around relationships. It was around people. It was around being happy and making other people happy. And uh, mm. yeah, everything that was you know around words or figures or didn't interest us. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what is your career? Uh, I'm a facilitator, so I work with groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you? And I studied to be an engineer, but I actually chose to stop once I got my diploma, and I'm actually trying to coach into a young in typology. Okay, so did, did any of your, your, uh, your engineering skills find their way onto the map? Um, well, I know how to do them, but I don't really like them. You know, it's like okay. skills I acquired, but I kind of choose not to do them if I can. Yes, yes. How I like to say is the, the, uh, the things that go on your resume, but at the bottom of the resume. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, the reason I ask, thank you for sharing. The reason I ask is because uh, I've been doing very in-depth study comparing people of the same type. And the ENFP is the one I've looked at the most. Mostly I have these nice uh, interns who come from the university and they do the work for me. But um, ENFP is the one we, I know the most, 43 ENFPs. And of course maybe after this week even more. And we found, what is it that made a difference? Well, of course, many things in common. But uh, male or female, age also makes a difference. And career choice makes the biggest difference. Because your career, you practice every day. So imagine if you continue as an engineer of 20 years, then you will have, your brain will be wired differently. And now you have made a change, and your brain may be now more wired like her brain, as an ENFP. Yeah, so there's uh, always uh, those differences that can come because of career and culture. Uh, I compared the American brains and British brains. I know the sarcasm would be British simply have more of them. Um, but it actually is true statistically. Statistically. Uh, British people have more connections in this part of the brain used for abstract language. Concepts, categories, abstract humor sarcasm, metaphor, poetry. So it, it wasn't a joke. They really do have that. So now I'm very curious after this week, we will have, uh, maybe then I will have a total of 25 French people, not this week, but also in the last few years, to see are French people different from the British? Who knows? We know that. Yes, yes, we hope so. Yes. <laughs> Is there a, a pair here who had a very different type preference? Very, maybe two or three letters difference? Ah, okay. And, okay, yes. So did you, you find the similarities or differences? Differences? Differences, yes, and, and some similarities, but on, let's say, less, uh, Less evident, l less obvious, like move gracefully. We both have put this one, and oh. I don't know to which uh, uh, letter is linked. 
Um, yeah, and there is of course more figures on uh, the NTG uh, compared with ENFP and yeah. ENFP like everyone in this room. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, so some uh, like, like, chart and, like chart and diagrams, it's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's an ENTJ. So. And then there's the, I have a feeling embarrassed. Feeling embarrassed, yeah. yes, yeah. That's where I'm strongest. <laughs> He's strongest at feeling embarrassed, yes. We will find out, you did the brain imaging today, so we'll see how strong it is, yes. Uh, thank you. Anyone uh, have any uh, the questions or about this or maybe want to uh, share a special result? Well, well, just, just one question. Yes. It's regarding the fact that potentially you have, um, I would say, the, the, the impact of the past. You know, you mentioned something like, you know, your work, what you've done before and so on has some influence on the way your uh, brain behaves. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how uh, we can talk about kind of uh, static uh, s uh, brain. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yes, okay. yeah, we, we. <laughs> yes. so uh, whatever you circled today, would you have circled that five years ago, ten years ago, five years from now? Is a very good question. Um, there are two ways to assess brain activity that at least I can do. And one way is to look at just how active each area of the brain is or not. I will show a picture of this. Okay, so we can say that maybe someone has these uh, areas here that are white that are most active in the brain over one hour period. And then maybe these black areas are the least active. There's activity, but not so active. Um, this could be true for two or three months, statistically, is valid for two or three months. If we gave you some similar activities and nothing has changed in your life, then you will probably get a very similar result. But if I gave you meditation for one hour, instead of all these different things, um, or you have to take a, a dance class, and you don't know how to dance, okay? Then maybe you, you come from that and your brain will be different after three months. Okay, maybe, yes, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, the other way to assess the brain, I will just jump ahead for a moment so you can see it, is a picture. Where do we have the picture? Ugh, I thought I had a picture of it. Oh, maybe it's at the front. It's at the very front, yes. No, no, I didn't. Oh, you are the one who had it on the slide. No. Uh, no, oh, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So what else we can do is we can look to see how the different parts of the brain are connected. Uh, this part it connects to this part, this part connects to this part, and so on. Those are valid for about two years on average, regardless of what you're doing in your life, or even what kind of activities I give you. Because the, the, like a social network, you know, your social network doesn't change drastically from one day to the next, hopefully. Um, maybe you have a secret family or something you keep on the side. Um, so no, even then your brain would remain the same, they're the same people. So it's, uh, you have these connections and those take a long time to form through habit. But then they're also remaining a long time. I think that answers the, yeah, yeah, okay. Now let's take a little bit more uh, look at this person. Uh, we will say this is the brain of uh, Adele. This is actually, a real, it is a real person here uh, from early on. And these are favorite regions. Stay open and seek new data. Weigh pros and cons, uncertainties and risks. Navigate using tactics like for football or the basketball. Hand eye task focus. So this is like playing video <laughs> games or maybe working on an assembly line. <laughs> Follow a line of reasoning. If uh, my dog is a mammal and all mammals, um, uh, you know, give birth, uh, live birth, then my dog is a mammal. So therefore, it gives live birth. Is it's uh, that's you know the reasoning that happens there. Except if you know it has to be female. 
So that's uh, it, you have to. So it gets complicated. You start reasoning using words. Would you say this person prefers a more um, a sensing or an intuiting preference? Sensing. sensing. Yes. Yeah. And does this person prefer more thinking or feeling preference? Thinking preference. Yes, that's right. This is from uh, uh, ESTP or uh, ESTP. Yeah. And um, you know, a, diff a person with the same type could be slightly different, but we see how we use tools, we use our brain to meet our needs. So maybe two ENFPs with similar profession will use similar parts of the brain, same needs. But we could compare maybe some other ENFPs with someone here and see, oh, they have different professions, uh, grew up in different cultures, so there'll be uh, some differences, but still they will be meeting their type needs in some way. So this is what it looked like. And in fact, when I did statistics, this is what I found. Example, the INFP and the ESTP. And um, we can analyze how active each region is and look at the, their sort of learning style and work style and so on. If, how many of you have seen or heard about MBTI Step 2? Step 2. Yeah, this is what that's like, MBTI Step 2. So, of course, every person is not going to have the same Step 2 result. That is the whole point, the uniqueness of the person. That's what we see here. Uh, you also can see that uh, different types are almost opposite results. Yeah. Now, maybe they, they also have a very different, uh, well, these were students, uh, they had different majors. Um, but if these were older and had different professions, that would not be a surprise either. Different skills, different parts of the brain. So I use this information, the favorite regions, white, to come up with a sort of favorite style favorite executive style, so that's this region up here, or this one, one of the two, and then there are other four favorite skills, or five favorite. On the slide, five fit, but in real life, I say six. Uh, strengths, personality pitfalls. Wow, that is so old-fashioned, it's, uh, I love it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how many of you are familiar yes, with Strengths Finder or the Assessing Strengths? Is that maybe that's popular here or not? No, not so famous. Not so famous. Okay, it's very popular in the United States. It just focuses on your strengths, your skills, and the positive things. Um, in, in, in the, in the times. Uh, no, not, it's not related to type, but like type, it focuses on the, the strengths, but it's about skill, not a preference. Yeah, but here this is a combination of both skill and preference, because you're using these parts of the brain, and these are your favorite parts. And um, maybe you, you have a skill, but it's, it's not a favorite skill, like you don't want to be using it, so there's not motivation. But you know what, it's still a skill, so it's going to be down here. And then if you have motivation and you have skill, oh, I'm an ENFP, I've got people skills, you do, then it's going to be a peer. This person is not an ENFP though. This is a very focused uh, judge, goal focused, grounded believer, emotive listener, insightful futurist, quick anal uh, analogizer. What do you think this person's type preferences might be? ENFJ. So it could be ENFJ, yes, yes. It could also be INFP. INFPs like to think, oh, I'm very open. And they are very open until they're not. <laughs> I like to say um, ESTJ makes uh, 10 big decisions before breakfast. ENTJ also, big decisions. INFP also makes big decisions, but not over breakfast. Or if they do, it's more like over 10 years. 
I had a friend who, um, I SFP, but he spent five years, no, it's three years, three years, deciding whether or not to be a vegetarian. <laughs> because he wanted to know, I need to commit to it or not. So actually I found in uh, INFP uh, and uh, you know, other types that have feeling or thinking as a dominant, made the top function, then actually the focus to judge, the decision maker is very strong. So if you approach the INFP with the question of values, if you come to INTP and uh, you, you ask them a question and they use decision making on something that they know about, they're the expert in it, that part is already very wired into the brain. They're very clear on it. They may not be able to communicate it well, those are different skills, but, um, but they're very clear on the answer or at least the, the way to decide. So this is an approach to understanding what's going on with people. And I don't, this, this result is not just, you know, one time. It's uh, when we, we look at everything, how the person's whole brain works. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you about before we get into more detail um, with each of the types is this idea of flow. So it's like a creative flow. I can't say the man's name, the very famous man. Yes. The, oh, here, if someone can pronounce it, bless you. Chick sent me high. He, he says it in the books. He says, just think, Chick sent me high. Chick sent Easy. me high. Okay. Easy. Oh, okay. Yes. It's similar to how I remember stuff on the guitar. So it's, uh, I will keep that technique in mind. Chick sent me high. Yes. So it's this idea of flow. And I see it in the brain is uh, the very, uh, the, it's a blue in the display. Um, not the display we will see today, but it's a, the usual display is blue. And, um, but it's, it's really, it's like when you turn on the radio and you tune to easy listening music. But you turn the volume all the way to maximum. And then you just immerse in your favorite relaxing music. When does the brain show this? In every part of the brain. Not when the brain is asleep. Okay, this is a special time. When do we get into flow? So there were, there were some people who would show this flow when I would ask them to do a task reviewing the past. That was actually an activity you did today, reviewing your past experience, real past experience. Another activity I would give people is to envision the future. We didn't have time for that, but that's something I do. Uh, which types do you think the brain would go into flow in reviewing the past? SJs. SJs. Maybe we could get even more specific. Maybe the ISTJ, ISFJ, ones who have the sensing, introverted sensing is the dominant function, as first function. In contrast, um, envisioning the future, by the way, was INTJ and INFJ. Um, and I just, well, I'll tell you about age later. I want to contrast reviewing the past, though, with this one. Playing a musical instrument, I don't know where it is. Ah, singing one's own unique song while playing a musical instrument. So, how it would work is this. I met him. He was, uh, any of you know Paul Teeger, a very famous person in the type community for many years. His son came to me and did a brain imaging session. And his son has a, what we call a shtick. He has a performance, way he does a performance. And he comes to the audience and he says, I want you to give me two words. We'll, we'll get to one word. Um, you, sir, could you contribute any word? Ring. 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 Ring, okay. And uh, how about you, madam? It's pennant. a pennant. Planet. Planet. Ah. So we have to now come up with a song on a guitar that involves a ring and a planet. Hmm. 
Where, oh, where shall we marry? Where, oh, where shall I put that ring? Shall I take her to Venus? Shall I take her to Mars? Shall we fly off to the stars? I do not know. I do. <gasps> but I do. I have the idea. And then he would continue on with the song. And he's playing guitar at the same time. And he just made that up right there. He got into a state of flow all three and a half minutes. What do you think his type preferences were? ENFP, yes, yeah. Why not just make up something right there? A little beautiful random something. So people showed all these different activities, juggling back and forth a ball that was ESFP. Listening intently to someone else or to only a respected authority figure. If you ever, how many of you work with the ESTJ? Okay, have you ever wondered how to get them to listen? <laughs> it's not easy, right? Yeah. Uh, my grandmother had the ESTJ preferences. I discovered what works with her. I would start my sentence by saying, the Pope says, <laughs> And eventually she would ask, when did he say that? Where did he say that? <laughs> yes. But the Pope was, uh, il Papa, was a respected authority figure. Uh, I also had one young man. He, uh, he showed the state of flow when listening to women, but not when listening to men. And this for him was very helpful to know. Because he said, now, he says, now my life makes sense. He said, my, he says, I have female friends. He says, I have lots of female friends. He's ESFP preferences. All these women tell me, uh, what was it, Karim. Karim, you are such a good listener. Oh, we love you. You are such a good listener. <coughs> but then he would go back home to his fraternity, where he lives with the, his other like, uh, male students. And um, they all tell him, Kareem, you're a terrible listener. Kareem, you never remember anything we tell you to do chores or activities. And now he knows because he listens. He's in a state of flow while listening. But only to women. <laughs> so I suggested to him, you can imagine if you really need to listen, imagine that the person you're listening to is a woman. <laughs> and then maybe that will help. A beautiful woman and then you will know. Um, when we engage a task for which we have expertise and they're motivated and we need to improvise, the brain gets relaxed and very energized with all of the regions working together in sync. So of course our type preferences are going to be things that we're motivated to use. Usually we have expertise. Preference often means skill, not always, but often. And improvising is how you go through an interesting life. So this beautiful state of flow, there are other kinds of uh, whole brain activity that we can have. We will get into that. So the last slide for this section, two people who identify with the same preferences have brains that are Exact match? No, hardly ever. Very similar. Okay, like the two of you. Very similar. See, this is a big piece of the pie. 50%. Pretty similar. Yeah, there's some differences, but uh, mostly similar. And then very different, it happens. You know, it can happen. Of course, a different culture, a different upbringing, different career, a different life experience and skills. And if you, if you are a science-minded person, you want to know the slices of the pie are based on what are called R values, 0.7 to 0.98, which is like amazing. So it's, uh, 
Type is not the only thing, but type matters. Finally, I would say the brain is like an orchestra that usually plays our favorite songs. Usually. You ever have those days when it's not playing? So you see he's asleep. And uh, she's very motivated. He's very happy. She seems... Uh, mm. And uh, he is using his nose to play, for sure. I've zoomed in on the picture. And uh, so all of them are doing something different. Yes, yeah. But then notice, that, you know, there's the differences. But much like our brains. You know, it doesn't always work every part, but for the most part it's playing the music that we need. The different parts of the brain are the different musicians. Except we have two conductors. That's the madness of human experience. Okay, questions? And how are we on the... Ah, perfect! 59 minutes and 35 seconds. I was aiming for one hour. <laughs> Uh, questions? I was so shy. If you were German, I would hear many questions. <laughs> mm, yes. Yes. <laughs> oui. Yeah. I was born in uh, Germany, but uh, I'm French. Um, my question is pretty obvious, but is it possible to type somebody with uh, EEG? Um, is it possible to type someone with EEG? The, an the, the honest answer is no. Um, because the EEG is more like MBTI step two. It's assessing the developed self. So what have you developed? So your skills uh, hopefully meet your type preferences, but also your career and all of these other things. Uh, certainly, though, if we did the EEG right away, we could eliminate maybe half of the types, maybe even three quarters of the types as being unlikely. Or I would ask, boy, your brain is very strange for your type preferences. How is these skills meeting your needs? And maybe they have an answer, but maybe not. Yes. Can we measure the, let's say, individuation path yeah. with uh, EEG? Um, you know, that's a good question. So you're talking individuation, you sort of mean the type of development oh and non-preferences. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I noticed within each type, there may be two, two flavors, common flavors. One flavor is more likely to be in business or technical profession, more likely to be young, more likely to be male. There's another version, more likely to be in um, human resources, the arts, uh, somewhat more likely to be female, um, uh, more likely to be a little bit older. But each of them just contributes, so maybe a male musician Painter has, you know, one creative version of the brain. So these are only contributing factors. Um, I found that these differences tend to disappear after age 55 or 60. So like the sex differences between men and women are very strong in the young college students, 18 to 25 years old. Then in 25 to 55, career has the strongest imprint. And after that, the different versions seem to blend together in just one version of the type. So there is a kind of type development that you can start over here, or you can start over here. But eventually, at least statistically, they will converge to something. And many times there are favorite brain regions that, of course, meet your type needs, as ENFP or ISTJ. But then there will also be some brain regions that I look at it and I think, oh, you know, this looks like, um, you know, your opposite type. I have seen this with people in their 30s, 40s, 50s. If I just looked at how the brain was active now, today, I would think, oh, this person is ISTP. 
but then we do the computer analysis and the computer looks at how all the different parts of the brain interact and wired in a social network and it says INFJ and the, the network wiring takes years to develop so the years to develop as a musician, he was a musician, showed very clearly in the INFJ. But today, and from this point forward, he says, I love music, but I'm also going to start selling houses. <laughs> Which might seem very strange, but there was a path that made sense to him. Yeah, and now we... Re hmm? Do you have a question? No? No? Okay. <laughs> yes. One more question. Actually, yes. Actually, I've got two, two questions related to the, the mapping. Mm. Um, well, the languages, you know, there are so many words, and, and then you end up with such little focused words, and yeah, I was wondering yeah. how you end up with this first, and secondly, you've got few areas that are without any word. Yeah. Matter, what are they? Yeah. Um, Sure, I would say the map that you have is just like a, a fun introduction. It is an appetizer. Of course, if we wanted to get more detailed, if we wanted to know about a particular brain region, then we could read something a little bit more than a few words and see you know, how this works and how this works. And then you can uh, perhaps even then get the book and you get like two pages on each region. Yeah, so it goes into more detail. Yes, yeah, so just for fun. Yeah. Yes. In the assignment we just um, were doing, then the formulation of the assignment was something about how um, the different brain regions satisfies the needs of our personality type. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a chicken and egg thing there for me because I believe that, the, or I would think that the brain mm. regions were kind of there, your preferences in brain regions would make up your personality type. Mm. It's not your personality type that that kind of has a need and then uh, those brain regions satisfy. Mm. Or, or is it? Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, and uh, you know, there, that's why it's called a problem because there's no answer to it. It's a combination of nature and genetics and um, you know propensity but then there's also nurture and the environment and what the propensity hits up against something or maybe is just allowed to easily flow so it's uh, you know the difference between um, say uh, INTJ who um, grows up in a family with other intuiting types as the parents and siblings Maybe uh, though your parents are ESFJ and ESTP and they're thinking what kind of strange child do we have? Yeah, doesn't like to socialize, uh, isn't practical. Um, you know, it's uh, why haven't you started your own business yet at age 16? <laughs> um, you know, all these questions, I guess they'll be thankful you're not in prison. Um, <laughs> you know, if you turn out well, so it's... Uh, uh, you know, nature and nurture hit up against each other. I think it's very interesting to to meet um, maybe ESTJ parent with one child who has also ESTJ preferences, and of course they they feel a need to to you know make their own space and be their own person. So that can happen too. So yeah, very much. We I, I make no claims about where these differences come from or similarities simply this is what i see and we know it's developmental yeah okay fantastic and um now we have this activity uh the union functions based on brain use so how much time do we have i don't know if i want to use uh, we have 50 minutes yes okay yeah we have time but i know some of you are not uh, fa some of you maybe are We'll say more patient readers, some people more quick readers. Um, just do your best, it's not a marathon. And um, please read and rate each snapshot, then locate the favorite snapshot on each page, uh, left and right, <coughs> selecting two from different rows. And of course, if you know type, you can already start to cheat, but that's okay, it's not cheating, it's just... Um, these are based upon the results of the brain research. 
and I will give you a good uh, 10 minutes to read. Maybe more than that. Okay, let's come back together. Minasama, atsumete kudasaimase. Ano, shitsumon ga arimasu ka? Ma, kono tokoro ga toko ni urusai desu ne. <laughs> you can just guess from the voice tone, can't you? <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I, I don't have any structured questions. This is uh, any kind of questions you'd like. Thank you so much. I know we're... Remember, you can take these home and reflect on them at home or uh, even use them on your spouse or children, uh, other unsuspecting friends. Um, thoughts, questions, surprises. By the way, these are very tasty. I have not, I'm sure they have these in America, but I haven't seen them before. And they're just addictive. Yeah. It's forbidden to bring this in America. Oh, yeah. Oh really? Is it no import? Yes. Oh, that's so sad. Uh, I wonder if they have duty free um, at the airport. Yes. Mm. Surprises. Thoughts. Hmm? Yes. Euh, une surprise, une surprise, dans notre binôme, nous étions plutôt euh, bon, sur notre fonction euh, dominante et sur notre fonction tertiaire ou inférieure, bizarrement. Mm. So then we will turn to the... <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Si on peut répéter, je vais retraduire ah. pour vous uniquement, peut-être mm -hmm. Alors, sur notre binôme, euh, avec notre binôme, yeah. nous étions number. curieusement sur notre fonction dominante We were on the dominant function. et... Sur la tertiaire and ou l'inférieure Donc en bas. So, below. So, you had, um, what is, I, do, I don't quite catch the question. Bon. Je pas compris la question. Donc, c'est un étonnement. C'est un étonnement. We're just surprised to notice this. C'est un étonnement. Oh, so it was the opposite of... Yes, it's uh, just ah. a statement. She was surprised. Yeah. She oh, okay. Out. Yeah, yeah, the opposite. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Uh, we, we might not be done yet. <laughs> no, no, stay. <laughs> stay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what did you, you rank as the dominant? Alors, la dominante, c'était... Uh, C'est la N.E. Okay. Yes, yes. And you're, you're the dominant for your type. Yes. Yes. Voilà. Yeah. Et, et mon inférieur, j'ai trouvé celle-là. C'est mon inférieur. So this one is inferior. Infi uh, so dominant. Inferior would not normally be here. L'inférieur, ça yeah. donc normalement à ce niveau-ci. Ah bon, alors. Yeah. So how, how did you rate this one? Oh, oui, alors, pas du tout intéressé. Not interested at all. I'm not interested at all. Okay. So that was really nice. So so what would normally be Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would normally be third function first and then the second? Oui. Oui, is the second? Second. Yeah, uh, second. Okay. Oui. Après ça. We're feeling right. So maybe third. Third. Is uh, okay. is thinking. Oui. Yes, and then I love it. So the 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 opposite of extroverted intuiting is the introverted sensing. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not a excited brainstormer. It's mm -hmm. um. Pardon. Ah oui, pardon. Yeah, yeah. So diagonal across from this is this. Normalement, ça devrait être croisé en diagonale. D'accord. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the the ones that are diagonal are the opposites. Yeah. So I, I love that. So I asked her for the inferior, what, how she rated it. And she said, oh, no, I didn't. I had no interest. <laughs> yes. So at least the third function is not the inferior, but it merited some attention. Yeah, but it seemed still almost inferior. And sometimes it can feel that way. Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, uh, who else? 
Yes. Just wondering what exactly was the purpose of the activity, since we all know our type and we can read into it. Um, yes. It's for the wording, maybe? Uh, some of it is the wording. The wording. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, there's... Um, so what is the purpose of the activity? Because you know your type. Well, it's possible someone might be surprised. I don't think so, but occasionally. Um, it could be that... Um, uh, how can I say? When I use this handout with people who don't know type, the first discussion we have actually is not about their preferences, it's about their culture. So I had someone from Russia, and um, right away we needed to start with what does Russian culture encourage in order to filter that out. If you also think then, um, in most countries in the world, there's going to be a bias uh, against women and, and against men also to be a certain way. So if you are male feeling type or a female thinking type, maybe with the eight functions, you will rate them somewhat differently. Because yes, there is a theory about how the, the eight go in a certain order, but we know in practice that that doesn't happen that way. Mark Majors has done a tremendous amount of statistical analysis. Um, he knows he worked on MBTI form M. He worked on the Majors PTI. That uh, developmentally, some people may be in different, you know, emphasizing different things after the first function, second function. What exactly is the third for you? So having some room for development. Uh, the other reason is this. Uh, you know, if you want to learn about the eight functions, what resources do you have? You can go to the internet. How many of you trust the internet as a, as a place to get information? If you trust information. Uh, okay, the millennial has raised his hand. Yes. yes. So you can get information, yes. How much do you trust it? Each site is hard to say. People come along and they make up their own definitions of the functions. Uh, you can go to Jung's original descriptions, written in, what is it, 1921, in German. Uh, so, you know, that reflects a particular period. You have to remember that Jung was raised as a child in the Victorian era. Okay, that was before World War I. So, the world was slightly different then. He himself said the functions are abstract. That is why he used the word function. Because a function in mathematics is something very abstract, a set of relationships. I do this because it's just like a line or a wave. When we try and put meat on the bones, then that is going to be reflective of our current time and our culture and so on. You can also read the modern type descriptions. And if you read by Linda Barons and me, you will get one version. If you read by... Um, uh, who else has written? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm trying to think. I don't know all the French ones, but uh, in the United States, there's Alan Brownsword, and there's Naomi Quank, and uh, BB, John BB. Um, and uh, each of them, you know, has a slightly different version. So it's a nuance sometimes. And I just wanted to give you definitions of the functions that were based upon the brain imaging research. So it's another data point to consider. And along the way you may see some things that surprise you. And um, in the details, not, not in the big picture. So you might think, yes, I know I'm ENFP with uh, extroverted intuiting. But what does that mean? So I, I will use, a, this is something that came up in the lab. And um, I wonder if I can do a live example. It's, it's already in a slide at the very end, so maybe I can just go to there and eat this little morsel at the same time. I believe it's at the very end. Ah, voila. Okay. So here I have brought these five pens to you. With the sensing activity might be described these pens in detail, such as color, size, smell, when you would typically use them. So the one on the right 
the far right, the pencil, you would use that when you know you need to erase something. You know? This um, fat one, the, the, uh, the purple one, purple top, you know when you have to make like a big, you know, display. With some sensing kinds of things. Now the intuiting one, which of these pens would you prefer to go on a romantic date with? S'il vous plaît. To the far left. Yes, and uh, what kind of person is that? An artist. It is an artist. Okay, literally, or just a personality is the... Um, personality, I would say. Yeah. A personality, but you also wouldn't mind an actual artist. <laughs> yes, okay. And um, let's see, how about you, sir? Uh, which of those, assuming you're, you were single? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, which of these five would you prefer to go on a romantic date with? Oh. Maybe the, the last from the right. No the, no, the one before the last. The fourth one. Second ah, last. Okay, so the, the black one that's yeah. the fine pen. Yeah. Yes, and the, what kind of person is that? <laughs> uh, a person I would like to sign. <laughs> you, ah. <laughs> person you would like to sign, okay. Yes, perfect. So this is an example then, not of, of intuiting, yes, but I would say really extroverted intuiting because we can keep on imagining different questions. So these are also places you can go on a holiday to. Which one would you prefer for a holiday? For a holiday, the, the, the pink one. The pink one, and yeah. what kind of place is that? Well, that's... Um a place with flowers and uh, nature and uh, yeah. yeah a place with flowers and nature and it sounds relaxing and yeah okay anyone want to go um, on holiday to to this place where is this gosh um, yeah this one uh, this one is maybe Switzerland <laughs> yeah so we aren't talking about the literal thing we're taking a set of relationships and comparisons bigger smaller more colorful uh, more dull, uh, you know, the, these all the, can you refill it or not? The pen, can you refill the ink? Can you erase what you did? We're taking these relationships, these ideas, and mapping them onto a different situation, like romantic dating or going on holiday. So I wanted to emphasize in the descriptions of the functions that there are... Um, uh, you know, not just me making up something, but what I've observed in the lab from the activities that people do and who finds the task easy, who finds it hard, and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful question. One, one more question. Or thought. Don't be shy. You spoke about cultures, and uh, what about Asian people? Do you think that the Asian people react very differently, or the mapping your mm. brain is very different? So, um, I have not worked very much with people in East Asia, some from Singapore, but mostly in India. Uh, in India, it was graduate students in business, uh, the sciences, and also um, like a human resources. People in India, much more towards the back of the brain and the left side, the left brain. So much more, um, how can I say, like a quiet to follow directions. And on the surface, we might not think, oh, Indian person, you know, the stereotypes of the guru. And the guru is like a very social and telling everyone and interacting and so on. But no, actually, the culture is, is fairly conformist. Um, and you know very much to pay attention and observe and synthesize what you are hearing and seeing and so on and bring it into something. Um, that style also I find there's this pattern of a brainstorm mode where all these things can come in at once and you process them in a creative way. Very very rare. I think I saw that in only one person out of I don't know like 40 people from India I haven't, I haven't done them there. I have a colleague who does them in Mumbai, and then he sends them to me. Um, so the culture, for some reason, the schooling is pushing away the creative style in India. 
how it is in China or uh, Japan, Korea, I don't know. Um, uh, hopefully sometime I'll probably have a chance in Japan to find out. And the Japanese, you know, very, you know, chanto ni ne. You do exactly as, a, you know, you pay attention and you do exactly a certain way. Um, that's the pressure that's applied to them. Not every person, but the cultural pressure. Yeah. Okay. Um, where are we? Ah, okay. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. So now um, I'm going to prepare a demonstration for you. And uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit of leading into the demonstration. Um, this is uh, Coach Norbert Reinhoff. He's in, uh, not in Germany, he's in Czech Republic. And uh, he's part of the type community. He gave permission for the pictures. Um, a client using EEG, it's actually not a client, it's his uh, like assistant at the time, a few years ago. A junior consultant to gain insights, uh, flexibility. So uh, Norbert uses a coaching style that includes neuro-linguistic programming and LP, um, and the usual coaching techniques. The client is wearing a band like this. I will put one on in a moment. Um, and then the monitor shows the brain activity using the, you know, sort of colorful stuff. Here's some examples. Um, it's sort of hard to see here, but uh, this one is all black. These different, four different views. So the brain is very quiet. Here you can sort of see three of these regions are very active. It's a very excited state. Body connection, only one region on the left, lower left is active. This is a body connection, is what it indicates. Over here, only this one in the upper right is uh, active. Is a problem solving without emotion. And then this one here is not super excited, but it's showing more emotion. Uh, this is just him doing the subject of doing different things. He really liked this because you notice it has no wires on it. He has the ESTP preferences. And for him, he would just get up and move around and do things. So it was very nice to capture a natural style from a sensing perceiving type. Um, so this is the device we'll use. Uh, the headset has 14 sensors. So not the full set of sensors. But enough, I thought you would enjoy the stylish haircut. I looked for something on the internet with the picture, so here we are. Um, and it shows the brain activity in real time. Um, the volunteer will be me, because that's pretty easy. Um, and then you can use uh, the handout you already have with the picture of the brain to help see what's going on. Now what we will need to do for this, um, I would say if you desperately need to use uh, le toilette, now is the time because we'll probably spend one or two minutes to make sure everything is just right and we'll do the demonstration and we'll talk about it afterward. Hi, Mina Sama. Sito o kaete kudasaimase. If you don't know how to say something in Japanese, just say the word and then add an o or an a. So seat, sito, door is a door. So it's, uh, you know, pretty close sometime. Fork, forku, knife, knifeu. Apparently they didn't have knives before they encountered English. I don't know. Um, spoon is spoon. Uh, that's, uh, but that doesn't, you know, then that's the end. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, this is my brain live. It's not uh, perfectly calibrated, but um, it's close. And you'll notice that where there are circles, there are sensors, sensors, but in the middle here, there are no sensors uh, because the device just doesn't come with them. Uh, when I asked why, they said, you know, there's uh, to get the sensors to stay on the head there and work properly, it's not good. So this is just for fun, it's just for display. Um, it follows the map with the nose and the ears that you have on your handout. So 
what do we see here? Well, we see four views. Um, this view here will get active if I'm sleeping. I'm not sleeping. Good. Okay. Uh, this view here, this is called theta view. Th this was the delta. This is theta view. Uh, theta gets active when you do routine problem solving. When you do things that you already know how to do. Okay, so obviously right now I'm doing some things I know how to do. I'm using my basic brain architecture to work. Over here, this is the alpha view. And this view is for body connection. So with most people, this is the most active. It's just default knowledge. Here is going to be some body connected. Some people will have more body connection, some less. Mine is some. It uh, could be more, maybe. We'll see what we can do. And then this view here, beta view, is the most active when I'm excited. I, I, I have some, ex ooh, I'm excited right there. There was a moment of excitement. Oh, and now it's quiet. I'm not excited. Um, so this is also when some kind of learning or aha moment happens. This region right here on your map, where is this? You might wonder. This is work efficiency. That's right, work efficiently. Yes. Yeah, so surprise, you know, the INTJ, work efficiently. Yeah, that's going to be on even when having fun. Are we having fun efficiently? Um, there's some social feedback at T5, so processing social response is going on. But mostly you want to look and ask with this view, it's like with an earthquake. Where is the epicenter of activity? Where does the activity start and then move out? This view is not so easy to see, but in this view we see some here, we see up here and here. Those seem to be the epicenters of activity. This view here is the right executive region. So the open-ended executive. And even, how can I say, like in the two flavors of INTJ, yes, I have a technical background in engineering, but in practice I'm definitely the open-ended, slightly disorganized. Um, does probably too many things at once, INTJ. But somehow I manage all of those processes, uh, usually with a little help. Then over here, uh, yes, we have work efficiently. And oh, what's going on? What is this one here? Con concepts, categories, reasoning, in the, the sort of abstract language reasoning. So if you want a British sense of humor, so sorry, I can't give that to you today. <laughs> But, um, in fact, I, I have passed for British for five minutes, successfully, five minutes, which is a record for me. But then I couldn't say which uni I went to, and, and I couldn't keep up with the humor. It's just impossible. So, it's, um, so I have that abstract reasoning that's going on, working efficiently. Down here, what's this? So this is some visual area of the brain. And both of these have some activity. Maybe this one is a little bit more active uh, down here. A little bit more. I'm not, yes, I, you know, this is a chart or diagram, but for me, I've seen this many times before. So where I'm paying, more paying attention to is just the overall visual impression. When you are driving a car and you look at a sign to read the sign, you are using this region here when you are driving a car and you are just paying attention to the movement of traffic in general, is something coming from the left or the right or whatever, then you will be using more this region. Also, if you go to the Louvre and you're going to look at uh, Monet or Renoir or something like that, then you want to be using this region unless you want to analyze, you know, the exact brush stroke technique and so on, very precise. And in general, we see that maybe this is a favorite region for me up here. Uh, but you know, there's some other activity that happens. Of course, the goal-focused region does work, but it's working in the background. It's not driving to anything new. There's no body connection with it. I have to be honest, the only time I get excited about goals is when they're done. <laughs> Making lists at the beginning and then when they're done. Everything else is to be enjoyed, hopefully, along the way. Um, 
So this gives a sense of, uh, you know, I'm sort of stereotypical for uh, INTJ from my type. But let's see, you know, what happens when I try different things. So the, who, who does meditation? Okay, fantastic. You might wonder, you know, gosh, does meditation do anything for the brain? Uh, I don't know what state I'm in because having jet lag and so on. I mean, I feel fine, but uh, we'll see. Oh, this is very uncomfortable. I'm not going to be able to relax with this. If you, if you don't do meditation, let me tell you, I have seen people after only 10 minutes of instruction, good instruction, learn to go, they think they're meditating and their brain looks like this. And then they get instruction and then they're able to relax their brain. So please, if you want to learn how to relax your brain, do one, even one meditation class. Yoga, like whatever it is, it's close and you will learn to... Relax that brain, yeah, especially for people who have intuiting thinking preferences, you know, maybe you're in a job, you have to use your brain all day. It's nice to get some body connection over here, just relax in general. And, um, you know, how many uh, ENFJ or INFJ do we have? ENFJ or INFJ? INFJ, yeah. So one, one, um, complaint about stress I hear from NFJ's types is um, even when you go to bed your brain is still working. The beauty of, well first of all NTJ usually we just know how to turn our brain off. It's like a machine. Boop, you turn the switch off. But nonetheless this is an example meditation can help quiet it. Now we could do something else too. I mean I'm wearing this maybe we could do something. I didn't bring a ball but surely there has to be something fun we can do. Part of our demonstration, anyone want to... Uh, maybe, maybe we should talk about Donald Trump? How about that? Oh, <laughs> oh okay, yes. I mean, so there was a really funny moment. Um, in, in August, when I was living in Norway, they had uh, elections then, municipal, like city elections. And I went by and I saw in the main park was a truck to re-elect Donald Trump in Norway. But it was all a joke, you know, to get people to come, and uh, so it's very, and it's a type story, by the way. Uh, so I'm very curious, I'm riding my bike, but I think, you know, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to ask, there are two men, who look like they're my age, who are sitting there. And I thought, you know, I bet they're thinking types, because this is very provocative to do, and probably people will come by and, you know, say nasty things to them or something. But who knows, maybe it's INFP, you know, is, uh, so I go, I'm very curious. So I go over and I ask him and I said, oh, you know, I'm from America. I actually don't really pay attention to politics, but I'm curious what motivated you to put this here. And it was, and I talked to him for 10 more minutes. I think he had ESTJ preferences and his answer was so amazing. He said, so many people come to me, Norwegians on the street and they come and he said they yell at me and they insult me and he said they give me all this negative energy and I just turn that into positive energy and I feel really good. <laughs> so who says that ESTJ can't do alchemy? I mean and so I told him I said wow that's amazing that is like a human superpower to take negative energy and he was really he was relaxed and laughing and happy. He says, when the person yells at me, I, def I feel great because they're giving me all this energy and I just change it into something positive. Yeah, I might be wrong about his type, of course, but nonetheless, that's sort of a surprising thing to think. It'd be great to see him on display here, what's going on in his brain. How would you react if people come, and strangers come and yell at you? Yeah, and not just one or two. Yeah. They're going to come and pick a fight with you, yeah? 
So there is a, so how was my brain acting as I was uh, telling the story? Yeah, some people have more, notice in the upper right, that's uh, more steady. You would hope I'm, you know, present and thinking. I'm thinking, you can see, I'm thinking. <laughs> but am I really thinking? How much am I feeling it? Oh, you can see I'm feeling it for sure. You know, and I have, for me, it's like a pulsing style. I turn off, I turn on. I turn off, I turn on. But for here, this is pretty consistent. And then this year, yeah, I'm a little bit excited, but you know, I don't live in the land of excitement all the time. I have met NT types who were just solid here because their brain is like, <laughs> oh, these things, you know, it's like 18 year old INT. Oh, you saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh. <gasps> um. No, okay. Okay, I was worried if I thought my brain had frozen or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, no, I went back to thinking when I was 18 and you know how my brain was then compared to now. So now hopefully it's a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. Okay, being efficient uh, task organizer. What is our time? And uh, oh, I need someone to log, I need Sylvie to log in, s'il vous plaît. You can um, log in. Other questions about this technology or um, Maybe you want to, to rile me up? No? I have a question. When yes. You, when you say this one is for, when you say this display is for uh, demo, really, um, how, how much do you use it in your practice in the US? Um, if I want to create a pro, how much do I use it in my practice in the US? If I want to um, do a demonstration like this, then I'll use it for sure because it's very easy and I can walk around and so on. I used to use this with Teams uh, because it was quicker than the other one and also it just uses a uh, saline solution and the cap, the, the medical cap uses a gel that's more like for, um, you know, it has salt in it but it's like a hair gel, it's very thick and you have to, you know, and it gets in a person's hair and then they have to wash their hair and so on. <laughs> It is a slight, but it's not as bad as it sounds, but it's, um, you know, it's hard to convince strangers to use it. So, uh, you know, I hesitated for a while, but actually I have switched now to really only use the medical one when I want to give good results, consistent results, because it is medical quality and because it will get to all these parts of the brain here. These are very important, especially, uh, you know, these parts of the brain, it's called parietal lobe, is involved with like a 10 or 12 major skills. Everything from playing sports to doing mathematics, a body connection, um, being able to think in the many variables. It's very useful for thinking and sensing functions. I don't want to leave out those people and their skills when evaluating them. Um, and it turns out people don't mind the gel so much because I just really hype up what they're going to get from the results. You know, Americans are very good at marketing and advertising. <laughs> Everything is the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> I mean, haven't you seen it? Um, yeah, see, it teaches us to be excited. Yeah, a good question. Yes. Uh, Est-ce que vous pouvez vérifier uh, avec, avec ce casque uh, Check with this helmet the attitudes of introversion, uh, extroversion mm. and, the, and the JP uh, dimension, dimension uh, mm. aspect? Yeah, yeah, good question, yeah. Um, so I, when I do this, uh, so I used to use this with teams. So it gave me some good data to use. And I found that people who had a lot of activity here, like not just in this view, but in all four views, up front, the, the, the epicenter of activity was from the front, the very likely to be extrovert preferences. Front and middle, but when it's more middle and back, then much more likely to be introvert. Certainly, if it's mostly in the back, mine is not. I consider myself an extroverted introvert. I'm not shy, I'm not uh, hesitant with people, something like that. 
Um, I get tired, maybe I don't like them sometimes, it's like a you know, normal reaction, I'm not like Asperger's or very quiet or something. So I'm more in the middle, you know, see some here and some here. So I see some bias that way. Certainly we see FP1 and FP2 is the two executive styles and those also have a strong effect on whether the person is maybe not perceiving or judging function but more which functions predominate <coughs> thinking feeling thinking feeling and my thinking function I'm using from here it work efficiently I'm if I were like ENTJ you know like to do, do, do extroverted NTJ then you know making lots of decisions and you go over here and you do this and so on then it would probably be up here instead um, but still my dominant function is going to be this uh, process orientation gathering data reflecting on it later mostly later your question also raises an interesting point I'm with a group of people I'm extroverting even as we get the brain imaging data so it's a biased environment what would happen if I was tested quietly in a room by myself and allowed to do whatever I want listen to music, daydream, uh, whatever it is of course we would probably get to now the activity would move to the back of the brain if, especially as an introvert so the environment that it happens in, even if it's just the client and me, I'm another person and I'm making it a social experience. So I'm forcing the, the person to have to extrovert to some extent. It's a bias and there's not really any way to get rid of the bias. But what I tell people is we are getting a snapshot of you, your development, like everyday kind of use most people every day have to work with other people it doesn't matter if you prefer to work by yourself quietly at home probably you have to work with other people so we get something that's like your work self and that's even with the tasks I give people is more like a work self yeah thank you uh, yeah I guess if I want to the EEG is the easy electrical activity on, yes on, on your surface or on, on is there any connection between this uh, activity or measures and the uh, synaptic connections or neurotics? Yes, I will show that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are, you are asking about a deeper, like can we get a, a, a picture like of the connections between the parts of the brain, the networks, can we go deeper? The answer is yes, we can do that two ways. Well, I say we, I mean the computer can they do it? The computer can tell us what these connections are between the regions. You can sort of see visually some patterns, certain things come up or down together at the same time, but it's not you know, the accuracy we want. And um, we also know from years of experience that we can infer some things about the deeper in the brain, even though this is only measuring the surface. And the surface is very important. The surface layer, the neocortex, is the part of the brain, it's maybe uh, two and a half, uh, no, two, two and a half centimeters thick, maybe two centimeters. Um, and it's where all of the interesting learning, civilization, training, we think like a conscious experience of what we do, that, that is part of this outer layer of the brain. So we're getting this picture of a sort of human self but we could go deeper and we can look at the animal self the part that you share with your cat or your dog um, monkey you know whatever it is and we could look deeper if we wanted and um, okay so I will show you a few more slides after this I think we'll switch back to this one now um, so we will say au revoir to my cap and, and it's also the other reason to use the medical cap is this one is sort of pinchy, it pinches. And the medical cap looks funny, but once it's on for five minutes, you forget about it. Yes? Before you take it off, can you tell us some about the delta order and 
when, what do you see there when someone is indeed asleep and what does that I, I don't know. I've never worked with people who are asleep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in theory, it's supposed to become active like this. Uh, but in that view there. Um, the, but I, I think it's calibrated in a way um, to only, the, the, the software is designed in a way. It's calibrated in a way to make this only show up when we sleep. Otherwise, it would actually be quite active, but it would be giving information that's not useful. So it's sort of a long story, but it's, uh, I, I don't know per se. Um, in fact, most of the time people have activity here, but that activity is things that are sort of unconscious or semi-conscious, and it would be good to know. And that's why also why I use the medical cap, because the medical cap it doesn't have a calibration or bias in it. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Yeah, I'm ready to take this off. There we go. Voila. Beautiful. Okay, so we saw the headset. And um, where's the little controller? There it is. Okay, so um, the volunteer with me. Uh, normally, I do select someone from the audience if there's time, who usually a male who's close to bald, but not exactly bald. So you might have been a good candidate. Uh, we see one or two others, because very short hair, so it's easy to make it calibrated. Also, yeah, this device is not useful for women with long hair, because you see these little pieces, then they get caught in the person's hair, and then they disappear. <laughs> Someone finds them at home at the bottom of the shower, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so this uh, summarizes so uh, the the four quadrants. So when you, if you want a copy of the presentation, it's in English, but do know that there's a record. You will be able to see this. Yeah. And if you want a photo, yeah, then that's. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so what is this question about links and flows in the brain? So I have about 10 minutes. Is that good? Yeah, and if you agree, we can send the presentation to participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we will send the presentation to participants. Um, so a network involves uh, different regions of the brain firing together. Pairs, whole groups. In this example, all of the brain, it means, is firing simultaneously at once. Uh, this whole brain pattern in black. Uh, it's called the starburst. Um, this one here we see like um, yellow, green, blue, the red and the orange. So those regions are firing together also, like three people at a time doing something. Um, we cannot see this really visually, but the computer can see this because this synchronization happens every one two fifty sixth of a second very fast uh, now here's some examples we can see the wiring of the brain is more in the front the dark colors red and black here the wiring is more in the back this is not in the moment. This is determined by statistically by the computer and reflects a long-term habit building. So the person who asked the question earlier, how reliable is this? This is reliable for two years on average, maybe even more. Most people will get results. Some results will be from things they learned in childhood, even will be there. So which one do you think is the extrovert, the one that has more in the front of the brain or the one that's more in the back of the brain? The back of the brain is like listening and um, observing and then taking those and collating the data. So this is more introvert style and here a more extrovert style. But this is more behavior. I've seen introverts who have more connections in the front because they have a job. For many years, it's very extroverted. Like they're a manager, they see people every day, they have to interact with them, it's, it happens. Then we look at which parts of the brain are working. This person, the very auditory, see by the ears, these are connected with a line. The hearing on both sides is a very synchronized. The line means that they fire together and working together strongly. This is a person with feeling preference. 
Now, a person with thinking preference might also have very good language use, but is more likely for a person with feeling preference, especially like a feeling judging preference, because they're talking to people and listening all the time and so on. But if you are a professional musician, that will also show as that. And you could be ISTP and professional musician. Maybe not a good listening skills, care in everyday life, but for music, yes, very much so. Um, this one has a starburst pattern in the background, gray. Not black, but it has this pattern. This does not have it. The starburst pattern shows for people with strong intuiting preference, or for people in creative profession, or for people with sensing preference who are left-handed. So if you want to be friends with someone with sensing preference, say your intuiting preference, your sensing preference, but you think, oh no, I'm so bad at sensing, what do I do? Find a left-handed sensing person. And just a little, like a, a cheat. Extrovert, introvert sensing. Uh, no, either way. Yeah, and in fact, a lot of uh, SFJ, so sen uh, sensing, feeling, judging types, have... Um, you know, this like a starburst pattern because they're in some kind of creative profession, especially ISFJ. Almost every ISFJ in the study, the 12 of them, is musician, artist, ballet dancer, something like that. They, and they devote many hours to what they do. They also do something else. I know one who is a school counselor by day and then at night he plays jazz music with a group. He doesn't like playing by himself, only with the group. So these are some influences. And if I wanted to look more, I see this region is very connected. Here we see this connection, these regions. Over here, not so much. This region here, very much involved with complex thinking. Many variables at once, five variables at once, 10 variables at once. How do you balance all of these variables? So more of a thinking preference for this person. So these are the, when I dig deeply beyond the demonstration you saw, this is what I see. Uh, then this actually goes to ENFP brain wiring. And um, this, is, this is a slightly older one there. We only looked at 17 of them, but actually now there are 43. But it still holds. I just didn't feel like, and the interns didn't feel like redrawing it. It takes a lot of work to redraw. But um, these tended to be, these were the males, and these are the females. More of the males were artists than the females, but nonetheless female more likely to show this whole brain pattern. ENFPs though have this strange, like all these regions connected in here. It actually, this whole thing is like a 10 regions connected. And they have the back and in the front. And if you look at the favorite regions here, abstract use of concepts, uh, beliefs, individual identity, listening to others, a carefully voice tone and intention, paying attention to body language, various things. There's also some good like extroverted thinking type of stuff here. Um, so some differences, but like I said, these differences for sex, they tend to be less as people get older, and by 55 or 60, they disappear. This is actually not a surprise. Biologically, the hormones change in people. By the late 50s, certainly, the effect has now been on the brain as well. Um, so that's sort of exciting. So these really hold up for them, mostly for young people. This was actually when also I was mostly working with college students. In the last, uh, I don't know, seven years, something like that, has been more people of all ages, all career backgrounds. And then sorted by career. ENFPs in the hard sciences and business, ENFPs in soft sciences, arts, humanities. And uh, this could be, so even if this pattern says male, and there's no like a starburst pattern, if that person, male ENFP is an artist, or uh, maybe, you know, is it doing, uh, you know, psychological counseling or something, they'll actually be like this one here. So different styles, just statistically. You see this pattern. You know, I'm not going to go into details about it, but it's um, 
I found that these really do have a meaningful difference and this is more midlife. This is like a young, you know, your teenager, young adult. And then this is more career age, age 25 to 55, is then we'll see some differences in the brain. And then one more slide I want to show you, and I mentioned this too. Short-term activity was for this person, just like we saw my example here today. And I thought, oh, this person looks like ISTP. All of these in the middle of the brain, supporting the sensing and thinking functions. Not in the ears. Look how quiet they are over here for listening and speaking very quiet. But in fact, the brain wiring says this completely different. Yours are very well connected. Starburst pattern, all on the sides of the brain coming around here. Very good. He's a musician. Actually, his, it, statistically, it looks like INFJ. But he's in midlife. And so he's actually showing this pattern. So if you wonder, I think some people in the room have gone through midlife or are there, right? And in companies, why is it somebody could be very good at what they do and you cannot even give them a raise for them to keep doing it? Because they will say, au revoir, either you move me to something more interesting or I'm just going to start a new career. It's because of this. The skills from years show this. But the brain is putting in energy to go here. Uh-oh. You know, how do, what does the person do? I don't know why this happens. I am not the first person to see it. But it seems to happen the most, like 35 to 55 year olds, when the two pictures do not match. And the person feels one way. You know, the brain is putting in energy voltage, electricity, to parts of the brain that are not well connected, and then the parts that are connected, they're so efficient already, why waste energy with them? So it's, it's a real human challenge. Midlife is a real phenomenon. Midlife can even happen when a person is 25, if there's a big difference. But it's a reminder, you know, that however we want to describe it theoretically, that Carl Jung observed a real phenomenon that happens in the brain. I say it's like signing your name. Your skills are so easy. Your preferences are so easy that as you get older, for some reason, you have this push to do your non-preferences, your non-skills. Yeah, I used to think that midlife was fun. And then I thought it was awful. <laughs> and now I'm coming around more to fun again, but we'll see. So yes. on an everyday life, which part of his brain will he use? Like the more long-term network he's had or actually the new ones? Um, well, he has these as skills, but this is where the motivation is. Okay. So he is going to experience uh, a conflict internally. Yeah, yeah. so it, 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 like even consciously he may experience that I have these skills. The brain will be using these, so he was still playing music, but his motivation had really gone down. So he knows he can do something, he can fake it, the motivation, but really the brain is saying, no, 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 go do rock climbing, go do a starting construction business with your family, go do the sensing thinking activities. Yeah, but then he's like, I don't know how to do them. It's a chance to restart. Yeah, so we really experience internal conflicts and this is a kind of conflict. Yeah, the other kind can be in the two executive regions of the brain can maybe not be well connected or maybe they can be in conflict with each other. Yeah. And then that's uh, the questions. Yes. And let me see if there's any meaningful slide afterwards. I just say, oh, like what's, I, I will do the what's next. I don't, you, that's a summary of everything I said. We don't need that. We did this one. And then this is uh, the same as with type. Leadership, strengths, coaching, compassion, careers, couples, teams, type, the brain, they all continue to work together. Every application we know with type continues. Um, I have some sample books up here. You can see later, but let's go to the questions now and finish with the questions. So just the 
concept we were talking about before, I guess, mm -hmm. would be uh, like opposite uh, functions, so like the first with the fourth and the second with the third? In practice, yes. And um, I mean, I'd say from a personal experience, certainly what people have reported for decades in the Jungian, you know, depth analysis uh, studies and also in the type community. Um, I didn't appreciate midlife, like between the first and the fourth. I thought I knew, but I didn't know. Um, then when we see in the brain is there's also this big conflict that happens where energy is going to parts of the brain and it's like, why? And I found one way to work with it is I've done meditation quite a bit in the last five years. Um, and the yoga and so on. I, by the way, I hated yoga most of my life. Really hated yoga. It turns out I was just doing the wrong kind of yoga. I was doing like introverted sensing yoga or trying to. I needed to do extroverted sensing yoga. Um, and when I found the right kind, then that actually was very good. And I've done brain imaging uh, for myself while I was doing meditation or the yoga meditation and found actually the result looked like ISFP, almost my opposite type. Yeah. So that was really neat uh, to, to, yeah, and, and I believe it because now I understand, I still think ISFPs are crazy, but uh, you, you know the book, right? I'm not crazy, I'm just not you. But it's so hard to, to sometimes stretch. My sister had ENFP preferences. She has ENFP preferences. She had an ESTJ friend growing up and she's, I asked her, why are you friends with this girl, Katie? What, what do you have in common? And she said, no, Katie is great. She's the weirdest person I know. <laughs> so it's always, you know, there's this big stretch that can happen. But, um, but the brain helps us make the jump. I don't say it's guaranteed, but I would say if you feel a drop or somebody says a drop in motivation, you want to try something else, and you're 40 years old or 50 years old, and I know you're going to have children and you have to, imagine in America, you have to send them to college and pay for it. You have medical bills, you know, that could leave you in a homeless per as a homeless person. Um, so it's not so easy maybe to drop everything, but then maybe it's okay to start painting. Or, you know what, I know an ENFP, and you know something he does now, he realized, that around the house, if you leave towels, or something for too long in the closet, they start to smell. So he uses a little dryer pad. And he's so proud of himself to know to use a dryer pad to put in the different places around the house. And you would think that's such like a, an introverted sensing thing to do. And, that's, and so he does like 20 things like that now that are really funny. Um, but he still cannot stack dishes properly in the cupboard. Um, but all of these small things that are very, very humorous to see. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Anything about the brain? It doesn't have to be what we talked about. Some of you have teenagers, right, as children? Do you wonder what's wrong with them? <laughs> Yeah, I've looked also at some, um, well, they were already teenagers, but they were child prodigies. The very interesting results. I've looked at the, some people who have uh, Asperger's, so that's uh, the borderline autism. Also very interesting results. Uh, at what age can you see the, the type? Uh, at what age can I see the type? Um, personally, and Linda Behrens can tell you, because Linda has known me since 1994. I have known all of her grandchildren since they were born. Within weeks of they were born, I successfully guessed all of their types correctly. And there, for some reason, I, I don't mean to, like some things I'm terrible at, that is not one. For some reason, I'm able to, oh, you're a baby, INFP. And it did 10 years, 15 years later, now it's even more. It's like a 25 years later. And still, it's, uh, the type is there. So do I believe type shows up early from my personal experience? Yes. But, but with the EEG, which is the real question, and then statistically, 
uh, you know, there's a child um, the assessment for children. The ver there's a version of MBTI for children. Um, and that I, I don't know how that matches up with adulthood. I can't say, but it must match. Somebody studied that. Um, and with the EEG, I've never worked under 13 years old because uh, we have to get special training. Um, there are issues also about attention. The child doesn't want to be sitting quietly and so on, but the brain actually shows up and works differently for children than for adults, or so I'm told. So I don't, I don't actually work with children, so I can't say. Yeah, but we do know kids change a lot. Teenagers change even more. And then maybe around the age 25 onward, then the person sort of has a set way until midlife. So in the 15, 20, 25 years, let's say 20 years. And then the brain starts to change again. And all of this time also as the brain gets older, it gets slower. So somebody who's age 15, 20, the average speed, you know, these different connections in the brain, average speed is very fast. One half second, one second. With somebody who's age 25 to 55, eh, one and a half seconds, two seconds. You don't notice it much. Do you want chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry ice cream? A strawberry, or right away. There's no, no waiting. If I ask, you want chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? One, one thousand, two, chocolate. It's not really that different. But I want you to imagine older people, 55 plus, 65, I've even seen 80, 82, 83. 83 year old man, four seconds was the fastest time. That's very slow. Do you want a chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry ice cream? I'm on bio. Yes. So it's a vet, a very long wait. And I asked afterwards, so the, we also have these visual parts of the brain, the two visual parts, and they have to communicate very quickly because you have right field of view, left field of view, they have to coordinate. The time to coordinate should be very fast. One second, two seconds, when you're driving or something. His time was 19 seconds. He sees like a bicyclist coming. 19 seconds later, he responds to it. Needless to say, he doesn't drive. Uh, I asked his wife, he doesn't drive, right? And she said, no, he doesn't drive. No, in fact, I saw him because uh, he was a patient of a psychiatrist. And that was, uh, I mean, he was just very slow. Apparently, not due to medicines. Hmm? No impact with the um, medicines, can it? Oh, so that's another interesting question. What does the medication do to the brain? Has anyone taken, what is it, Ritalin or something for attention deficit disorder? You know, by the way, the average American, age 65, takes 12 different prescription medications. That's a very, I'm, I'm imagining in France the number is much lower. I know in Japan it is. I love, too, the statistic. One in four Americans is classified as handicapped in some way. In Japan, it's one half of 1%. <laughs> big differences. So how we define things can have a big impact. The kind of medication, the kind of lifestyle people have will have an impact. Yes, I would say I've seen people who are taking uh, attention, you know, medication for attention. It does change the brain. Antidepressants, we saw these four views. What the antidepressant will do is that this view that's for excitement and for insights and so on, uh, that part just goes quiet. So the person is more steady, which means the lows come up, but the highs also go down. It doesn't affect the wiring of the brain, the networks in the brain so much, but it does affect, that takes a while, but it does affect the brain activity quite a bit. Something looks, the person looks like a too steady. I've only seen people naturally steady that way who are like military veterans. Have you tried to get excited a military veteran? It's not going to happen because they've seen everything. Their brain is like a very steady.
Ja. ja. Any other questions? I think we have a... How are we? Maybe we have a four minutes. Yeah. Or are you ready to go home? Yes. Your brains are full. Oh, that's what I hear. Yes. Um, do you have announcements for the end of the... Yeah. Ah.